Greetings, everybody. Get out your King James Bible. Turn to the book of Jeremiah and chapter 13. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So far, I've found this to be an interesting study. I remember when I was in college, not Bible college, but regular secular college, that uh, one of the instructors said, the best way to learn a subject is to teach it. I was like, what? That doesn't make any sense. He says, yeah, try, you know, because when you start your lesson plan, when people are going to ask you obvious questions that you've overlooked, and by the time you figure out the answer to answer them, you've learned something. I remember I was in electronics uh, at a vocational school back when uh, Florida, uh, Florida had a lot of, we had a lot of electronics companies down here. We had RCA. We had IBM, a company called Solatron. I think they were some kind of a defense contractor. We had Pratt & Whitney. Uh, let's see, we had Motorola. So I thought, ah, electronics, that would be a good field to get into. Well, they moved them all to, I don't know, China, Singapore, Thailand. They used to call us Silicon Beach. Yeah, believe it or not, there was a time they called uh, Palm Beach County Silicon Beach because we had so many electronics companies here. But, uh, you know, Silicon Valley, California, Silicon Beach, Florida. I worked for a couple of uh, companies down here that were in electronics, but eh, all I know is I had an instructor and if you asked him a question, he'd ask you a question. I'm like, dude, I just want an answer to my question. He's like, you answer my question and your question will be answered. I got to admit, guy was really good. Um, he did a marine electronics. He was an instructor, or not an inst he was an instructor at the vocational school at night, but during the day he fixed uh, marine electronics. And... Uh, Taught us a lot doing that. I got to admit, he was he was really good. I was impressed uh, after a while because he'd ask you a question. And then when you figured out his question, your question was answered. So it's uh, kind of interesting teaching things in the Bible because it's like every time I do a lesson, I find something that I didn't know before. So... All right, well, Jeremiah chapter 13. All right, verse 1. Jeremiah is being spoken to by the Lord. Okay. Thus saith the Lord unto me, Go and get thee a linen girdle, and put it upon thy loins, and put it not in water. Uh, now women used to wear girdles back, oh, I don't know, when I was a little kid, to make them look thinner. But I'm sure that's not what this girdle is for. I'm not sure what exactly the girdle is for. But Webster's 1828 says it is a band or a belt, something drawn around the waist of a person, uh, tied or buckled. So, all right, so that's what, uh, that is what uh, Webster says. So, all right, so the Lord says to get a linen girdle, you know, a piece of clothing, and put it upon thy loins, and put it not in water. Verse 2, so I got a girdle according to the word of the Lord, and put it on my loins. 
And the word of the Lord came unto me the second time, saying, Take the girdle that thou hast got, which is upon thy loins, and arise, go to Euphrates, and hide it there in a hole of the rock. Okay, that sounds a little weird. A lot of people, uh, non-believers, laugh at this. But there's a whole bunch of uh, symbolism involved with this. So let's take a look. And, and why Euphrates? Well, Euphrates is a major, major river in the um, world. Now, the Euphrates is, uh, according to some, it's the longest and one of the most historically uh, important rivers in uh, Asia, well, w Western Asia. And then um, another one of the important ones is the Tigris River. And um, it is in the area of Turkey, Syria, and Iraq. Flows through those countries. Now, Turkey used to be called Greece until those peaceful Muslim Ottoman Turks invaded Greece and killed all the Greek Christians and then renamed it Turkey. Yeah, their capital was called Constantinople. Today, they call it Istanbul. So, yeah, keep that in mind. But what does the Bible say about the Euphrates? Well, let's take a look. What I like is what they call the law of first mention. So when something is in the King James and is mentioned the first time, kind of gives you an idea of what's what it's all about. You know, what's up? So let's go to Genesis chapter 2. You know, it says uh, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it, he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Uh, let's see. And every plant of the field before it was, uh, before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, that the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So it never rained, but there was a mist. I guess, you know, heavy, very heavy dew, right? Uh, let's see, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And that word breathed, whether you look in the Hebrew or in the Greek, as in the New Testament, has reference to spirit, wind, spirit, believe it or not. So God had a body, you know, God formed man of the dust of the earth, a body, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, a spirit, and man became a living soul. And when you hear people say that the uh, Trinity is a false doctrine, well, you know, the Bible says that man has a body, a soul, and a spirit. And they're not the same thing. We are a three-part being. Well, and of course, you will have the Jehovah's false witnesses. It'll show you a three-headed God, 
or a three-faced God, I should say, a three-faced God, and say, this is the Trinity, this is the Trinity. They're absolutely ignorant. Of course, they said the world was going to end by 1976, but, oh, hey, uh, we never said that, and uh, we got new light. Yeah, they got new light from the angel of light. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, and they will. They'll lie to you and tell you they never said that. Well, sorry, Charlie. I had a buddy of mine in high school that uh, was one of them. And he kept telling me, oh, the world's going to end, 76. Need to show me the literature. See, it says right here, Watchtower, literature, world's going to end by 76. God told him. Uh, yeah, which God? So 1976 came and left, and uh, hey, we're still here. So, But those are the ones that uh, will tell you that the... Um, Trinity is a false doctrine. Well, I don't like the word Trinity. I like the word Godhead. You know, as in Jesus was the Godhead bodily. Yeah. But we have, man was made in God's image, and we have a body, a soul, and a spirit. Now, verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Okay. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from thence it was parted and became into four heads. Um, so it split into four parts. The name of the first is Pison. That is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. There is Bedellium and the onyx stone. And the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hidekel. I hope I'm pronouncing these right. That is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. Now, you got to remember something that, uh, you know, things probably... Now, this is before the flood. Genesis 2 is before the flood. The flood was in Genesis chapter 6. So, did things change? I, uh, you know... But Euphrates has been around for... Ages and ages and ages. So, all right. Uh, one more thing I want to take a look at. Well, maybe two. Euphrates was a very, very major river. Uh, let's see. Genesis 15, verse 18. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt, and I'm guessing that's the Nile, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. So from the Nile onto the Euphrates is going to be the land that the Lord gave to Abram, who he changed his name to Abraham, which means father of many nations. Deuteronomy 11.24 Every place wherein, whereon 
Every place whereon the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours, from the wilderness in Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even unto the uttermost sea, shall your coast be. So that would do, that was to be their area. Now, if you spend any time on Bible sites, uh, they're going to try to convince you that the land that God gave to Abraham is in sub-Sahara Africa. Uh, they totally ignore, I mean, totally ignore everything, basically. You know, I mean, come on. Uh, they, they think that uh, we took the name Euphrates and applied it to what is now called the Euphrates River and totally ignored what it was called in the past and then rewrote all of history. I mean, really, you're going to tell me that uh, the land of Israel, and I'm not talking about that little thing in the Middle East right now, but, you know, I'm talking about the land, was in Africa? You know, I don't think so. Now, the land of Israel, the land, is basically the hub where the continents of Africa, Europe, and Asia, what they call Asia Minor, all meet. I mean, it was like a trade route. People from the Far East, people from Europe, people from Africa would all travel these routes going from one place to the other. They would go through these areas. So it was inevitable that there would be a lot of conflict. You know, empires would rise, empires would fall. Um, uh, Egypt, because of the Nile River, was a the breadbasket of that area. I mean, it's just, you know, when you got water, you can grow crops. Same thing with the Tigris, same thing with the Euphrates. If you've got water, you can grow crops. That's just the way it is. So, there's a reason why the Lord said, uh, Jeremiah, okay, take the girdle, wear it. Okay, now, uh, verse 4, take the girdle that thou hast got, which is upon thy loins, and arise, go to Euphrates, and hide it there in a hole of the rock. Okay, so is this, Euphrates was like a border of Israel. All right, so Euphrates was one of the borders of Israel, but there's another thing. Remember, Euphrates is a uh, very, very important river. And there's a thing. Obviously, rivers are full of water. Well, do you know that water has a special meaning in the Bible? Yes, indeed, it does. Revelation 17 and verse 1. Talking about Babylon, the whore. Revelation 17, verse 1, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore. Oh, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Many waters. I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. Spiritual fornication, right? And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Fornication. 
So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, royalty colors, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And everybody is so quick to say, see, see, those are the colors of the, of the Vatican. Well, yeah, but the Vatican copied those colors from the, uh, the Levitical priesthood from the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament. Those were the colors of the priesthood. So, keep that in mind about the golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Keep that in mind, the golden cup. Keep that in mind. Verse 5. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great. Ah, remember the mark of the beast? It would be either in the right hand or in the forehead, right? Right hand or in the forehead, 666. But here it's upon her forehead. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Do you realize there are people whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world? Oh, Chaplain Bob, that's Calvinism. I, hey, if John Calvin understood this, then, you know, maybe he knew something that uh, the people that claim to be Arminians, uh, whosoever will, maybe he knows something they don't. You know, people hate this. You know, they'll, they love to tell you that God has a chosen people over in the Middle East that deny Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. To them, that's God's chosen people. Really, the people that deny Jesus is the Messiah as the Christ are God's chosen people. Chosen for what? What are they chosen for? The Bible says that he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth upon them. I think I'm paraphrasing that a little bit. I, I really should memorize some more scriptures, but what can I tell you? The beast that thou sawest was and is not shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was and is not, and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And everybody will run and say, oh, yeah, that's Rome. That's Vatican City. It's on seven mountains, which is, you know, Rome's on seven mountains. But guess what? So is Jerusalem. 
Jerusalem is also the city on seven hills. Oh, yeah. Verse 10. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seventh and seven and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them. Oh yeah, the space force, right? The U.S. space force. We're going to make war with the lamb. Star Trek. Fire those phasers. Proton, photon torpedoes. Fire. Uh, ain't going to work, people. Ain't going to work. Sorry, Charlie. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And they that are with him are called. You got to be called. And chosen. And faithful. Oh boy, I could do a whole Bible study on those. Uh, let's see. Six words are called and chosen and faithful. So you got to be called, you got to be chosen, and you got to be faithful. Uh, and everybody loves to say, oh, Calvinism's no good. Well, I, you know, I, I've never really read much of Calvin. I don't even know what the guy believed. But if he believed in election, which they credit him with, uh, isn't that what being called is? And chosen? I mean, let's face it. When people go to an election, you know, a national countrywide election, they're choosing somebody, right? You know, they're making a choice. Did the apostles choose Jesus or did Jesus choose them? Jesus even chose uh, Judas Iscariot. He says, have I not chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil? Oh, yeah. You see, Jesus chose them and they chose Jesus too. I mean, they could have said, I don't care. I don't want to be your disciple. I'm happy being a fisherman. Jesus told Peter, I shall make you fishers of men. Oh, yeah. Called, chosen, and faithful. All right. Here you go. What about the waters, chaplain? Bob, man, you're talking, talking, talking. Get to the point. Okay. Verse 15, and he saith unto me, the waters, remember we're talking about the Euphrates River, right? Uh, Jeremiah's down by the Euphrates. What's that song? Down by the river. Uh, well, maybe that's not a good example. I think that was a Neil Young song. Never mind. And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So sometimes... Water is water, and then sometimes it's people, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Oh, yeah. Now, what about that golden cup? You know, we're talking about Mystery Babylon. Well, let's skip up to Jeremiah 51. 
Verse 5. For Israel hath not been forsaken, nor Judah of his God, for the Lord... I'm sorry. I know. For Israel hath not been forsaken, nor Judah of his God, of the Lord of hosts. Though their land was filled with sin, though their land was filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel, flee, run like heck. Well, the four-lettered uh, four H word would have been better, but yeah. Uh, there might be children listening, so. Flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her a recompense. In other words, payback. You've sown evil, you're going to reap evil. Verse 7. What about that golden cup? Here we go. Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand. Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine. Therefore, the nations are mad. Huh. Well, Babylon was the first world empire. And sadly, her religious practices still exist today. The, um, do you know there's a book called The Babylonian Tall Mud? T-A-L-L-M-U-D? Actually, delete one of the L's and then make those two words one. I'm being real careful, people. Real careful. But uh, that's the opinion of the, uh, the people that were arguing, arguing with Jesus all the time. You know, the, the scholars. Yeah, that was the, their opinions in a book. And basically, that word means learning. So it's Babylonian learning or learning from Babylon. So, yeah. So let's go back to Jeremiah. Now, Euphrates probably has a double meaning here. One, it's a border of Israel. Two, maybe it's talking about the people. I don't know. You know, so here it is. Jeremiah was to take the girdle wear it, and then go to Euphrates and then hide it in a rock. I'm like, what? That don't make no sense. Well, that's what I used to think, but now I kind of wonder. I don't know. And I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just, I'm just kind of throwing that out there because I don't have a better explanation. So, Jeremiah 13.3, And the word of the Lord came unto me the second time, saying, Take the girdle that thou hast got, which is upon my loins, and arise, go to Euphrates, and hide it there in a hole of the rock. So I went and hid it by Euphrates, as the Lord commanded me. And it came to pass, after many days, that the Lord said unto me, Arise, go to Euphrates, and take the girdle from thence, which I commanded thee to hide there. Then I went to Euphrates and digged, and took the girdle from the place where I had hid it. Behold, the girdle was marred. It was profitable for nothing. Well, yeah, it was stained. It was dirty. It wasn't, you know, it was no good anymore. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, After this manner will I mar the pride of Judah, and the great pride of Jerusalem. Huh. Okay, so here it is. He's got a piece of clothing, and it's dirty. So what's up with that? Well, maybe the Lord's telling the prophet through the symbolism that these people are dirty. Their clothes are dirty. Huh. 
Well, what about it? Now, in Revelation 7, if you read one uh, verses 1 through 8, you can read about the 144,000. But we're going to skip to verse 9. After this I beheld, lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes. White robes. They weren't dirty like uh, Jeremiah's girdle. You know, they were clean, white robes, and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? You know, who are these people with the white robes and where do they come from? Verse 14. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. You know, and he said unto me, these are they which came out of great tribulation, trouble, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. See, Jeremiah's clothing was dirty, but these have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Verse 15, Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and lead them unto living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Now, let's, uh, so we need white robes washed in the blood of the Lamb. And if you look at the modern Bibles, the, um, they delete that word blood an awful lot. You know, when I first came to the Lord, I bought like, oh, I don't know, 10 or 11, 12 versions of the Bible. Um, I bought what was called the Parallel Bible. It had four different versions side by side on a page. And then I would read it in one version and then read it in the other version. And just the things that they changed and deleted made me realize, hey, this is important. Yeah, yeah, the blood, the blood of Christ is important. <laughs> you know, you know, it's pretty obvious. That's like, you know, cars need four tires to run, you know. But uh, in John 15, verse 20, Jesus speaking, he says, Remember the word that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, yeah, they did they persecute Jesus? Oh, yeah. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Unless, of course, you go to Benny Hinn's church, you know. Oh, no. God wants you healthy, wealthy, and wise. Yeah, you got to be rich. You're not going to suffer. God loves you too much. You're the bride of Christ. He would never make you suffer. No, 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 no. Yep, send me a... Send me $100 and God will bless you 20 times of praise of Jesus. Uh, uh, that's the Benny Hinn translation. So, um, yeah. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Yeah, they're going to try to turn your words against you. 
But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake. And that name is Jesus, people. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. What's a cloak? It's like a cape. It's a covering. They have no covering. They got no clothes for their sin. They don't have white raiment. They don't have white robes. They don't have it. They got nothing. Spiritually, they're naked. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin, but now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. Oh, yeah. If you hate Jesus, you hate the father that sent the Jesus. What's this about clothing? Hey, how about Matthew 22, verse 1? And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son. Well, who's the king? God the Father. Who's the son? Jesus, who is Christ. And who's the bride? The church. The church. You know, there's a, there's a spiritual application here. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding and they would not come. Remember? Called, chosen, faithful. Called, chosen, faithful. And sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it. In other words, they were joking around. They thought, oh, pff, you know, eh, whatever, dude. I don't care. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. Who were the servants? The prophets. They killed him. And when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. He was mad. He was P.O.'d. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Oh, yeah. This is going to happen when the Lord returns in his glory with his army of angels. Verse 8. Then said he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. Oh, yeah. Hey, uh, this guy doesn't have a, a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how comest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. What can you say to the king? Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. 
For many are called, but few are chosen. Oh, yeah. Jeremiah 13, 7. Then I went to Euphrates and digged and took the girdle from the place where I'd hid it. And behold, the girdle was marred. It was dirty. It was filthy. It was stained. It was profitable for nothing. It was good for nothing. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, After this manner will I mar the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. This evil people, which refuse to hear my words, which walk in the imagination of their heart, and walk after other gods to serve them, and to worship them, even shall even be as this girdle, which is good for nothing. For as the girdle cleaveth, cleaveth to the loins of a man, so have I caused to cleave unto me the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah, saith the Lord, that they might be unto me for a people and for a name and for a praise and for a glory, but they would not hear. Wow. The Lord wanted his people to be a people and a name for praise and for glory. But they wouldn't hear him. They wouldn't listen. Verse 12. Therefore thou shalt speak unto them this word. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Everybody, I'm sorry, every bottle shall be filled with wine, and they shall say unto thee, Do we not certainly know that every bottle shall be filled with wine? Remember, uh, wasn't uh, the whole world drunken with the wine of the fornication of the great whore? Uh, yeah, something like that. 13. Jeremiah 13, 13. Then shalt thou say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will fill all the inhabitants of this land, even the kings that sit upon David's throne, and the priests, and the prophets, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, with drunkenness. Oh boy. And I will dash them one against another, even the fathers and the sons together, saith the Lord. I will not pity, nor spare, nor have mercy, but destroy them. Hear ye and give ear, be not proud, for the Lord hath spoken. And you know what they did to Jeremiah? They threw him in a pit, in a dungeon, full of mud. Instead of repenting, they said, oh, I'm sick of listening to this guy and his doom and gloom. I'm sick of listening. Get rid of him. Threw him in a dungeon, in a pit of mud. Verse 16. Give glory to the Lord your God before he cause darkness and before your feet stumble upon the dark mountains. And while ye look for light, and while ye look for light, he turn it into the shadow of death and make it gross darkness. But if ye will not hear it, my soul shall weep in secret places for your pride and mine eye shall weep sore and run down with tears because the Lord's flock is carried away captive. Say unto the king and to the queen, humble yourselves, sit down, for your principalities shall come down, even the crown of your glory. The cities of the south shall be shut up, and none shall open them. Judah shall be carried away captive, all of it. It shall be wholly carried away captive. Lift up your eyes and behold them that come from the north. Where is the flock that was given thee, thy beautiful flock? What wilt? Thou say when he shall punish thee, for thou hast taught them to be captains and as chief over thee. Shall not sorrows take thee as a woman in travail? You know, a woman in childbirth. And if thou say in thine heart, Wherefore come these things upon me? For the greatness of thine iniquity are thy skirts discovered and thy heels 
made bare. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Uh, I guess if you get enough bleaching like Michael Jackson did, it probably can, but, uh, but I digress. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. Therefore will I scatter them as the stubble that passeth away by the wind of the wilderness. This is thy lot, the portion of thy measures from me, saith the Lord, because, because thou hast forgotten me and trusted in falsehood. You see, people, Judah forgot the Lord, and they trusted in evil. Verse 26. Therefore will I discover thy skirts upon thy face, that thy shame may appear, I have seen thine adulteries and thy nayings, the lewdness of thy whoredom and thy abomination on the hills and the fields. Woe unto thee, O Jerusalem! Wilt thou not be made clean? When shall it once be? Oh boy. Doesn't sound very good. Uh, can we make a connection between uh, Jerusalem and modern-day Europe, the UK, and the USSA? I think so. I think so. God's going to have his remnant that repents. But uh, a remnant is very small. I think a remnant is like basically a tithe of a tithe. A tithe is 10%. So what's a tithe of a tithe? Maybe 1%. I don't know. I mean, I might be wrong. But uh, a remnant. A remnant, people. All right. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen.